Okay, it's 12.01, so I think I'll get started. Uh, it was a last minute um, announcement, so uh, may not many be many people uh, joining in person, but hopefully some more catching this uh, recorded later. Um, so I think I better start off with the, uh, the theme music. The Clean Water Act 50 years take us back to when the Cuyahoga River burned. We got lots to unpack. 50 years, 50 facts. So check back, and we'll have more for you to learn. So, thank you for joining me today to celebrate the 51st anniversary of the Clean Water Act. Uh, of course, the big uh, anniversary was last October. October 18 was when uh, Congress overrode a uh, presidential veto by uh, President Nixon to uh, pass the Clean Water Act into law. Um, I, uh, I kind of missed, uh, we, I think we did maybe a social media um, post uh, last October, um, but after that, I you know, started thinking about um, what can I do to educate myself and educate other people about this uh, complex and very consequential law. I certainly encounter um, terms from the Clean Water Act constantly uh, in, in my work. Um, and so I had the idea of uh, putting out 50 facts. And initially I was going to, you know, just uh, do one or two sentences on, on Facebook and uh, um, every week on, on Facebook and on Instagram. Um, but then our, our marketing guy, Mike, was looking for some uh, short video content for Instagram, um, and so I, I thought I'd give it a try. So we're currently at, uh, on fact number uh, 42, um, the series will go through December, and we should have uh, 45 videos. Um, you know, that 90-second uh, timeline for Instagram has been... Uh, time limit for Instagram has been really challenging. <laughs> it takes a lot of uh, a lot of bad takes, a lot of uh, editing to uh, get down a, a topic this comp complicated and have a complete thought about it. But it's been a lot of fun to do. Um, it's offered me a chance to uh, make some music. Um, I you know play keyboards and and uh, do a lot of recording in garage band. So uh, in addition to the theme music, I've done uh, four other music parodies as as inspiration has has struck. Um, and I've uh, gotten to explore Iowa a little bit um, to to do my filming. Uh, visited three wastewater treatment plants, two storm sewer outfalls, two wetlands, uh, wading in the marsh, two construction sites, two lakes, and uh, many creeks. Often in the course of my regular monitoring route. Um, the other place I've spent a lot of time is in the weeds. <laughs> so I um, wanted to uh, take the opportunity today uh, with a little bit more time to uh, zoom out, take a big picture look at the uh, Clean Water Act. And I have a, a simple framework that I'm going to use throughout this presentation to um, talk about, you know, what works, what doesn't work, what's new. Um, there are two major uh, permit programs in the Clean Water Act, one dealing with um, uh, construction in uh, wetlands and in waterways, uh, dredge fill, um, the other dealing with discharge of pollution to waterways, so the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, and um, farmers are, are not completely unregulated, but they're regulated differently and a little less than in some other sectors, so I'll address those uh, separately. Before I um, explain that in a little bit more detail. I want to um, introduce myself and uh, address the issue of what business do I have <laughs> talking about this this subject in which I'm not really an expert um, and also um, talk a little bit about the perspective that I bring to this. Um, so, you know, every episode has uh, has uh, facts which are hopefully correct and I, you know, if I don't say those explicitly in the video, they'll be uh, at the top of the description in, you know, the YouTube or Instagram. Um, but, you know, usually I'll, uh, you know, have a little bit of snark <laughs> with some of these. So I want to explain, you know, where I'm coming from. Um, talk a little bit about uh, the Clean Water Act and then mostly focus on, on what's new because we've had three uh, big events that have impacted how the Clean Water Act is implemented. Um, so two major pieces of legislation um, and a major Supreme Court case. Um, leave some time at the end for questions and we would certainly like to hear from you on kind of what your perspective is on what's next for the Clean Water Act, how we can explain this, how we can improve it. Um, but if there's something I say that's confusing that you need clarification, feel free to use the, the raise hand feature or pop a question in the chat. I have uh, two screens going, so hopefully I'll be able to see that and respond without uh, um, messing up my screen share. 
Um, so here we'll get started. Um, so I, I've been with Prairie River since 2017. Um, and, you know, uh, so I might be an expert at this point in the science of water quality, but I am not an expert in water law or policy. I have a master's degree in water resources management. And for whatever reason, I think there were some schedule con conflicts. I dropped my water law class and I audited my water policy class. So I didn't learn all that much in school. Um, I uh, spent a couple of years working for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Um, and as part of that job, I got very familiar with two sections of the Clean Water Act that deal with wetland fill, uh, section 404 and section 401. Um, but the Clean Water Act has over 111,000 words, and I think I've only read 5% of them. Um, so, you know, one thing I can contribute is that I'm a big enough nerd that, you know, I'll, you know, go track down a permit and read it so I can have some uh, more concrete examples of how this stuff works in practice in Iowa. Um, and I'm a musician and a performer, so I hopefully can make some of this entertaining. Um, but mostly I'm approaching this as a concerned citizen who happens to work for an environmental organization. Um, and this is a law that really depends on the involvement of concerned citizens in public comment, uh, citizen suits, um, etc. Because often the regulatory agencies are reluctant to do anything until they're forced to do by, so by a court order. So what things are I am I concerned about as a concerned citizen? Um, so for the pollution side of the Clean Water Act, um, of course, there's always the big issue that, you know, there's some big exemptions for agriculture. And, and so those, um, you know, agriculture runoff has not been as well addressed as, you know, uh, sewage or, uh, you know, effluent from meatpacking plants. So that's something that you always hear about the Clean Water Act. And, um, and you know, so I think the issue is a little bit more pernicious than that, though, because that that exemption also, uh, you know, puts sand in the gears of other elements of the Clean Water Act. So um, I have concerns about the clarity, fairness and effectiveness of this law. So, you know, uh, something that I, I've run into is that um, Iowa DNR is not able or willing to pass a nutrient and criteria that will tell us how polluted the water is or um, write cleanup plans, TMDLs, that would tell us how to fix it because those documents then would affect effluent limits for sewage treatment plants and the cost would fall predominantly on small town ratepayers well only addressing a small fraction of the pollutants affecting rivers and lakes because again a lot of it is coming from agriculture and um, they don't have a good way of of, uh, um, of of addressing that so it really can get to be a mess um, and I'm, I'm not sure like where the best place to address it this is but you know this is kind of that big picture look that I want people to be aware of like why <laughs> why doesn't this thing work and how can we make it work better um, my concern on uh, the dredge fill side of things um, is that, you know, I've seen this in action and there are many potential points of failure. So sometimes, you know, environmental groups are playing whack-a-mole that, you know, we are able to, you know, achieve victory in one small corner, but, you know, DNR uh, just had a budget cut and they don't have enough staff to enforce it. And so that can kind of you know, even if you have protections on paper, maybe you don't have protections in practice. So eight ways wetland protections can fail. Maybe you no know, permit is needed. So now, especially with the new Supreme Court decision, uh, the agency might not have jurisdiction. The activity might be exempt. Um, and there are ways to drain a wetland. Uh, the, you know, this only applies to earth moving within the wetland. So if you put a ditch on the edge of the wetland, you can drain it without invoking this. Um, you know, a permit might be needed, um, but, you know, many permits are approved, um, sometimes without uh, enough, you know, protection. So there are general permits for small wetland fills that maybe are going to green light some impacts, um, you know, and really don't do that much. Maybe corral some activities that are, you know, separate out what's what's big impact and not, but, you know, there's a lot of things that are going to get green lighted. Um, there's an alternative analysis, but often that isn't really done seriously. It's sort of like, you know, uh, you know, a straw man argument of like, here's a ridiculous thing that won't work and here's what we want to do anyway. Um, you know, sometimes if, uh, you know, once you avoid it and uh, minimize there's mitigation but sometimes that's not done for whatever reason sometimes it's done badly um, you know the mitigation site isn't an effective wetland restoration or you you know what's what's destroyed is a high quality wetland um, and then sometimes wetland fills are done without a permit so maybe no one noticed until the statute of limitations has expired I documented many uh, cranberry bogs that fell into that category um, 
Uh, maybe the agency, you know, noticed this, but, you know, they have a limited budget or, you know, didn't prioritize agencies have some discretion. Um, and or maybe a fine was issued, but it wasn't big enough to change anyone's behavior. So there are many ways that, you know, you can have protections um, get stripped away in, in some way. So, you know, that's why kind of a big picture look at, at you know, often the enforcement is kind of the weak link. And, and I think that it needs to be addressed before you deal with you know, some of the, you know, edge cases in, in what's covered or what isn't covered. Okay, so big overview of the Clean Water Act, two big categories of permits. So section 404 deals with construction um, below the high watermark in waterways and wetlands. So, you know, development that uh, fills a wetland, um, many mining projects, um, and also um, projects like stream restoration because you're bringing an excavator uh, below the high water mark and moving dirt and rocks. And so the permit process, you know, all, you know, those will probably get approved, but you know, there's, there's a chance for regulators to make sure that it's done right. Um, and then the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System. I don't know, NIPDES, is that what people call it? Or an NPDES, um, so the Pollution Discharge Permit. So the, the um, example I'm most familiar with is uh, um, sewage treatment plants. Um, but there's many other categories that I fall into point sources. So storm sewers, um, uh, CAFOs, uh, incidental vessel discharge, um, industries of various kinds, construction site runoff, combined sewer overflows. <clears throat> so um, these permits, uh, different agencies have jurisdiction. So the dredge fill is primarily, in most states, it is the uh, federal agency, the Army Corps of Engineers. The EPA is the enforcement arm, so if uh, there's a violation, they'll be the one to enforce it, but um, it's the Army Corps that you're going to interact with uh, for issuing the permit. States do have an opportunity to uh, um, issue certifications so they can review, uh, deny, and modify, and some states have used that as an opportunity to cover um, additional wetlands that don't fall under the Army Corps' jurisdiction. Um, and then with pollution discharge, that is a state permit. In our case, it's the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. And then the EPA has an oversight role at the federal level. Um, so this does affect like where uh, with the Supreme Court cases, um, I think the, it, you know, that that's going to have a bigger impact on the dredge fill side because it's the federal agency issuing the permit. Um, and then there are exemptions and there are also general permits that, you know, for impacts that are deemed to be, you know, less have a smaller impact like you know if you're you know filling less than half an acre often there's a general permit um, that can kind of streamline the process and where there won't be quite as much uh, protection um, so for each of those categories there are some general permits um, there's some pretty big exemptions for farming on the uh, um, dredge fill side um, normal farming activity roads levee ditch maintenance um, are exempt um, I'm I, I don't really have a good sense for um, how uh, how uh, much is actually covered. Um, when I was reviewing permits I, I, uh, in uh, DNR, uh, Wisconsin DNR, I looked at um, hundreds of wetland impacts in three counties, and I think I only ran across uh, two permits that dealt with, um, with row crop farming. Um, you know, one was, uh, one was a wetland fill that they kind of uh, deferred to the, the USDA. The other was a uh, ditch maintenance that was kind of green lighted. Um, I don't know if that's typical. Um, uh, I did deal with a lot of cranberry bogs where that's, the, that's quite different. That is regulated because they're using backhoes to build the, um, the beds and the, and the dikes um, and the ditches. Um, but the big, the big exemption is for uh, agricultural stormwater runoff. So that's specifically exempt in the text of the Clean Water Act, as well as return flows for irrigation. And then CAFOs are kind of a weird situation um, that if uh, they don't propose to discharge, like they're not, you know, sending their wash water into the creek, it's not an open feedlot where there's stormwater rushing through, um, usually they can claim that they're not going to discharge. And then once the manure is spread on the landscape, it is transmuted into non-point source pollution and is not regulated. Um, at least uh, for, with this permit. So um, what that means that, that in practice, um, really the Army Corps has jurisdiction over uh, dredge fill uh, for non-farm industries. Um, the Iowa DNR has jurisdiction for non-farm pollution. And then it's the USDA that mostly is gonna um, have a role in addressing um, dredge fill through the Swamp Buster uh, conservation compliance provision. Um, of the farm bill, and then um, addressing non-point source pollution of, of, on farmland uh, through uh, cost share programs. 
Um, there's also quite a few uh, state and local laws that may come up where, you know, often I thought it was the Clean Water Act, but it really was a different law. Um, so state, the, the state of Iowa has um, a law regulating development on floodplains, so that may kick in even if the wetland laws don't. Um, uh, local uh, cities and counties will have um, um, regulations for stormwater management that may have to, you know, deal with uh, impacts from wetlands. Um, and then uh, pollution, so manure management plans, that's a, that's a state law. And then uh, manure spills and other things that cause a fish kill, um, that, that fine, uh, you know, when you get a, a um, when there's a news story about the there being a fish kill and the DNR issuing a fine, usually it's a state law, uh, the same one that would, you know, regulate uh, people, you know, illegally killing bald eagles off, or I don't know, maybe that's a different one. But anyway, um, there's a state law that um, deals with those fines, and then there are local ordinances dealing with uh, construction site runoff, uh, stormwater management from development, and often county ordinances for septic systems. Um, <clears throat> But there is, you know, a big double standard when it comes to agriculture and everything else. And I didn't realize the extent of it until just two weeks ago when I started researching um, ordinances for construction site runoff. So this is kind of a similar situation where you have um, pollution from uh, sediment uh, wash, you know, erosion and uh, sediment washing off uh, the landscape because the soil has been disturbed by big equipment. Um, but in the case of a uh, construction site in an urban area, um, they need a, a state general permit and a local um, uh, a local permit if more than one acre is disturbed, um, and uh, they need a sediment control plan to go with that to say how that's uh, the silt fences and detent and uh, um, sediment ponds and other things to, to control that. Whereas um, with farming, no permits needed. Um, you know, uh, NRCS will do conservation plans, but that's uh, that's voluntary. Um, and then this is a situation where uh, even though the runoff coming off the off the field uh, or the construction site is diffuse, often it's going into a pipe or a ditch. And in the case of a, of a city, um, the uh, larger um, communities will have a, um, a permit for their separate storm sewer system and one of the conditions of that permit is to um, inspect construction sites. Um, whereas, you know, if uh, farm runoff from farmland is going into a, 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 um, a drainage ditch or tile that's, that's uh, maintained by the drainage district, they don't have that same responsibility for managing the pollution. Um, so this has made me uh, question a little bit. Um, the the usual distinction that that I was taught between point and non point sources and the idea was that um, you know we regulate point sources like industry and wastewater because there's a single pipe that we can monitor there's relatively few of them, um, whereas you know non point source uh, sources like. Um, runoff from pavement uh, and, and lawns in an urban area, runoff from farmland, um, really couldn't be regulated because there's so many different actors and it's hard to keep, hard to figure out, you know, what's coming from where. But, you know, I've kind of realized that's not quite true and that's not how uh, this distinction works uh, legally because this is a legal term. So I have a little video uh, about this uh, that um, kind of, that, that I'll share again about the uh, the weird distinction between points and non-point sources. PRI, Prairie Rivers of Iowa, bringing you a disco favorite from 1977. Let me know Congress if the audio is to the Clean Water Act. Have you heard about the Clean Water Act? It's 50 years old, and so we've got 50 facts. And in this episode, we've got a new track about which pollutants need a permit from the Discernible, confined, discreet. Point source, discernible, confined, discreet. So these are legal terms, and it's not always plain how we treat the pollutants that are washed up by rain from the land. Cause sometimes after that, they go into a drain. And sometimes when they're regulated, I'll try to explain. Non point, storm water from agriculture is exempt. Return flows from irrigation are exempt. Point source, municipal, 
separate source sewer system. Point source. Concentrated. Animal feeding operations. Point Not point. Source. Guys, uh, what about drainage districts and those big pipes? So yeah, that was the, uh, you know, the thinking behind the Des Moines Waterworks uh, lawsuit. And, you know, I think we can, can argue about, um, you know, whether we want more regulation and, um, uh, but, you know, it's, it's kind of silly to argue that you couldn't <laughs> regulate um, drainage districts this way. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's a political uh, obstacle, not a, a technical obstacle. So the other edge case uh, um, that was mentioned in that video is, uh, um, CAFOs, uh, concentrated animal feeding operations, um, and you know I, I don't think that CAFOs are as you know the main driver of water quality issues in Iowa. I've seen some water quality data that makes me think they're just one of many. Um, I'll hopefully be able to present some of that research early next um, next spring. Um, but at the same time, I don't think that our existing regulations, manure management plans, um, and the master matrix for siting uh, CAFOs does a very good job of protecting water quality. So I'm going to share uh, one more video that kind of addresses this. And I think th this has put us in, in sort of a, a weird position where farmers are filling out lots of paperwork and feel like, you know, they're uh, being asked to do a lot, but because there are so many weird little loopholes and uh, um, lack of enforcement, uh, ultimately water quality isn't getting protected, so nobody is happy. <laughs> um, so I'm going to share one more uh, one more video. Um, I'm Dan Howe with Prairie Rivers of Iowa. Just this was done in the style of prescription drug. Some delicious yeah. Iowa pork chops. Fact number ten: Livestock operations of a certain size are classified as confined animal feeding operations and require a permit from the Clean Water Act. Only 167 of the more than 3,900 large CAFOs in Iowa received an NDDS permit. Large CAFOs can be exempted from a clean water and permitted they do not propose to discharge and do not have a history of violations. Prairie Rivers of Iowa has worked with some large swine and cattle producers who are early adapters of cover crops and are excellent stewards of the environment. But voluntary conservation practices aren't for everyone, and not everyone needs a Clean Water Act permit. For everyone else, there's state law. State law requires a construction permit and a manure management plan for facilities housing 1,000 animal units or more. Some farmers may find it helpful to set up separate shell companies for adjacent farms to get around this permit requirement. County government can only deny a permit if an application fails to achieve a passing score as established by the master matrix. Only 3% of applications for cable siting are denied. Manure management plans may include certain rare but serious side effects, including over-application of nitrogen based on a discredited yield rule, over-application of phosphorus by using a diluted sample to stand in for undiluted manure, inclusion of the same field in multiple overlapping manure management plans, or inaccurate field to stream distances. Ask your legislator about the master matrix. <clears throat> okay, so that's kind of my overview of, of the, the Clean Water Act. Um, but, uh, you know, have some new developments just in the past three years that are really affecting how, uh, how this is implemented. Um, so um, two of these uh, inject some new funding. Um, so uh, the Inflation Reduction Act of, of 2022 um, includes uh, a great many things uh, that deal with the transition to a uh, um, uh, low carbon clean energy future. And one of those is um, uh, additional funding for USDA cost share programs um, that can fund practices um, both that, uh, you know, uh, sequester carbon in the soil and that protect water quality. So a big infusion of funding for EQIP and the Conservation Stewardship Program. Um, the, the question I have is always like, uh, is, is the, you know, will people uh, use that that funding because sometimes you know we've had uh, projects we were uh, you know our watershed project we were only to able to spend maybe half our cost share funds so um, you know this could be uh, this could be a game changer it, it, it could not um, so that's uh, the you know the farm pollution side on the the non farm pollution side um, the uh, infrastructure investment and jobs act of 2021 the bipartisan infrastructure law includes a big infusion of funding for the uh, a clean water state revolving fund, um, SRF, um, and so that can um, fund uh, investments in um, improved sewage treatments and uh, improved uh, um, repairs to sewage systems. Um, uh, and then we have uh, the um, Supreme Court case, Sackett versus EPA, um, may have some impact on um, uh, 
wetlands uh, um, loss to farming, but uh, a, a really big impact on wetland losses um, in the non-farm sector, uh, things like mining and uh, uh, development. Um, so the, you know, point sources are where we've made more progress, but it's important to remember that there are many different pollutants, and even though we've, uh, you know, made big progress on addressing, um, you know, the uh, um, organic matter that consumes dissolved oxygen from sewage, you know, there's still nutrients and E. coli, those are only recently or uh, um, haven't been addressed yet. And so there's still lots of work to do on the point source side. So here's an example, um, a, a meatpacking plant in Storm Lake um, that uh, regularly discharges effluent with more than 50 milligrams per liter of nitrogen. Uh, the drinking water standard is 10. Um, uh, I know that they're uh, working on a phosphorus removal system, but I don't know about nitrate. Um, and then uh, sewage treatment plants um, just found out that um, uh, a, a sewage treatment plant in Nevada is the main source of E. coli uh, to West Indian Creek and Story County um, did uh, did some sampling. So um, 48,000 um, colonies per 100 milliliters in that effluent. Um, the standard is 235, um, and then a huge increase uh, um, from above to below um, that wastewater treatment system. Now, they, uh, um, Nevada is working on building a new plant that will include a UV disinfection system, but, you know, the fact that um, this has been going on for this long is only now being addressed as a reminder that, yes, still lots of work to do. Um, then there's uh, the Supreme Court case uh, affecting the uh, definition of waters of the United States. Um, so um, before this, um, of course, there'd been a, another um, big Supreme Court case in 2008, uh, Rapinos, that left things in, in a little bit of confusion. And then there was a lot of back and forth between uh, Bush, Obama, um, Trump, Biden administrations over the definition. Um, but the main, uh, the main point of contention was uh, jurisdiction over isolated wetlands and ephemeral streams, especially in the arid southwest, so streams that only flow after a rain and are otherwise dry. Um, ditches, I think, uh, you know, mostly are exempt unless, uh, you know, it was created by rerouting a stream or a wetland and it continuously flows. Um, uh, ponds excavated in the uplands are, are exempt. Um, but since this uh, Sackett versus EPA case, um, uh, now have uh, a, a, a binding decision that wet upland that uh, isolated upland uh, isolated wetlands uh, like the prairie potholes um, are uh, no longer covered. Ephemeral streams are no longer covered, and uh, significantly going beyond what the Trump administration had proposed, and um, and exempting uh, adjacent wetlands, so wetlands that are next to a uh, a river but are uh, cut off from it by a dike or a road. Um, so this was like kind of such a strange interpretation that even um, one of the conservatives, Brett Kavanaugh, uh, uh, dissented, um, and he said this erroneous test will create real world consequences. Uh, the example he gave was um, wetlands that, that protect against flooding on the Mississippi River where, you know, there's a dike in place, but the wetland beyond that is kind of part of the flood control project. So real world consequences for the waters of the United States and also was sufficiently novel and vague that it may create regulatory uncertainty. Um, so from what I've heard from, from people who know about uh, the Clean Water Act more than I do, this is going to have a big impact on uh, um, wetland losses to development, to mining, to other industries. Um, uh, I'm a little bit unsure on how big an impact this will have on uh, wetland losses due to farming. I'll talk more about on this uh, in a minute. And I, I'm pretty sure this won't have much of an impact on uh, pollution uh, permits. Um, the reason I think that, um, and this is based on uh, Scalia's interpretation in Rapinos, which I read, um, is that, you know, if before you had a point source going into an ephemeral stream, going into a perennial stream, and if that um, maybe before that that ephemeral stream was was uh, considered a waters of the U.S., it was jurisdictional, and so you know the effluent standard was based on the designated use in that in that stream. Now. Um, it's non-jurisdictional, but point sources include ditches, channels, uh, other discrete conveyances. So now the stream is not jurisdictional, but it's part of the point source. So if as long as that um, that uh, that flow ultimately goes into a jurisdictional water, there is an opportunity to um, 
uh, to regulate it. Uh, what might change are the effluent limits uh, a little bit if, if, if it's a long distance um, uh, from the stream that may affect the, the effluent limits. But this seems like, like less of a, um, you know, less of a concern than, than the wetland loss. So, of course, this has been a big uh, political controversy. Um, and uh, my opinion on this uh, is based on what Neil Hamilton has said about it. That, uh, he characterized it as a uh, manufactured controversy contrived by the Farm Bureau Federation to demonize uh, the EPA and, re and prevent uh, regulatory efforts to address clean water. Um, and, you know, I certainly can see how when you've got uh, um, an agency that people distrust and a law, law that's complicated that people aren't going to read it, that you can kind of say whatever you want about it and nobody's going to call you on it. Um, <laughs> so there's been a lot of hyperbole. And so my sense of it is like, you know, if if the, you know, the impact on farmers uh, of this law was blown out of proportion, then probably the impact of wetlands was also blown out of proportion. And generally what I've read in the fact sheets from Obama and Biden administrations that they weren't going to, you know, they were going to generally exempt um, most farming activity or have an expedited process that, you know, a general permit. Um, so probably, you know, which waters are jurisdictional doesn't really make much of a difference. Those, those wetland losses would have been allowed. Um, but where I'm not so sure is, is uh, you know, where, uh, where you got a drainage project that's, that's impacting um, more than half an acre. Um, and I think it's more than half an acre of soil disturbance. Um, so, you know, that could be an issue where we are going to see more, um, you know, more drainage tiles and more ditches going in. I'm not really sure. <clears throat> so, you know, kind of looking, looking to the future, I think there's some opportunities to improve um, policy around these, you know, these issues of, of wetland protection and, uh, and pollution. Um, you know, and so even if, if the feds don't have jurisdiction, there is an opportunity for um, protecting wetlands at the um, local and state level. Um, there, you know, and I think, you know, even there, there may not be much appetite for it. I think there'd be an opportunity to, um, to streamline the process, you know, and so that you have a clear, a clear definition of when you need a, um, when you need a permit and then, you know, really focusing on mitigation because it seems ridiculous that, um, you know, it seems like a waste to be spending all this money um, trying to get CREP wetlands uh, in place to treat farm runoff if, you know, we're draining and all these wetlands are filling them for development. That's canceling out uh, a lot of our efforts. So, you know, some kind of policy um, that would ensure no net loss of wetlands and that would streamline the regulatory process could be, um, could be really effective. Um, on the pollution side of it, um, you know, there's a lot of investments being made in wastewater treatment, a lot of new federal money available to do that. And so, you know, really thinking about how to make that, uh, make that effective and actually have that translate into more fishable, swimmable waters. Um, and there's this, uh, this idea out there of, of one water where we're looking at our drinking water, our storm sewers, our wastewater um, together in a watershed context and trying to figure out where to make uh, you know, how to get the most bang for your buck and how to make everything uh, work together. So I think there's a real opportunity there. Um, and there are some ways of, of uh, having, you know, the regulated uh, point sources working with farmers in the watershed to achieve uh, environmental outcomes at a lower cost. Um, on the, you know, on the, the non-point source pollution side, on the agriculture side, you know, I think we really need to be looking beyond cost share um, because it, it's, often not all that great an incentive, it, you know, cost share can be like a 50% a mail-in rebate, you know, that, you know, reduces your cost, but, you know, if it's not something you were going to buy anyway, you know, maybe farmers aren't going to take you up on it. So looking at, you know, are there some minimum standards in place to stop the kind of worst of the behavior? Um, are, you know, how do we shape uh, markets, uh, insurance to um, make it uh, easier to, to be profitable while doing the right thing? Um, and then um, looking at, at wetlands uh, and farmland, I think there's a real opportunity to rethink drainage districts because this is a local unit of government. And so if, you know, if through, um, 
maintaining and uh, increasing drainage or also uh, increasing nitrate or increasing flooding, there is an entity that, you know, could, um, you know, be held accountable, um, and, you know, and maybe have some requirements in place for, for farmers in that drainage district or, you know, maybe they're, they're assessed a, a fine and they use that to invest in, um, in, in treatment uh, systems. So, I think there's lots of opportunities to talk about how we uh, make our water policy um, work better because, um, you know, as, as much good as the Clean Water Act has done, it can be quite convoluted and uh, at 51 years old, it is uh, showing its age. So that is uh, my presentation. Happy to um, take questions now or uh, comments. So for um, beyond cost share, uh, are you limiting yourself to voluntary um, practices? No, and I think it's um, it, it's a little bit frustrating for me that you know that that's the Overton window or that's the ground rules for the conversation is like oh you know you know we can only talk about voluntary options for for cost share because you know farmers are already are regulated to a certain extent with manure management plans and and uh you know um CAFO siting permits and we ought to talk about how can we make those rules work better there are um you know other states that are doing things like uh um you know uh, mandated buffers in minnesota and so you know i don't think that should be off limits for for discussion i think we should be discussing um, what works with regulation, what doesn't, what works with uh, voluntary incentive-based approaches and what doesn't. Yeah, so I, I thought your comment about um, rebates was an interesting incentive-based um, program that, as you say, might not be worth it to, um, to farmers, but perhaps they would be. I guess I had, um, I, I have, it's been a long time since I um, was learning about the implications of Sackett versus EPA, but when you had your graph with the point source and so after Sackett, um, the, how much, how important it is in terms of the ephemeral nature of that um, connecting um, stream? You, you know, um, I, I <clears throat> like that, that is the, 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 the new, uh, the new test. Um, uh, yeah. created by, by the Supreme Court ruling is that um, a, a continuous flow of yeah. water is is the um, is the standard. And so, you know, one kind of weird thing is that um, in many cases, um, you know, sewage treatment plants and, and in industry are going to have a continuous discharge. And so I've seen plenty of streams that, you know, in the summer, um, they're flowing because of, of the discharge. So it may be that mm -hmm. they get classified as a, you know, a, as an intermittent stream or a perennial stream because of the effluent. Um, so that's yeah. kind of one, one way, um, you know, and um, in, in some cases, like the, the distance and the, the type of receiving water um, doesn't matter. So there are, uh, you know, um, technology based effluent limits that are about you know, the, the, the treatment technology and the minimum standard you should be able to achieve with that. Um, in yes. cases where there's a water quality based effluent limit, like I've seen this for E. coli and ammonia. Um, so sometimes they will look at, um, you know, at the designated use in the receiving uh, water and the distance to that. So there's a, um, you know, so there'll be a, a stricter effluent limit if they're applying to a stream that's designated for primary contact versus secondary contact. Yes. And then there's like an attenuation factor that's applied if it's, you know, goes through a, um, a ditch for, a, you know, um, 
500 feet before it gets to, to the water. So that's, you know, that my, my sense is that's one way where, where this might affect um, uh, water quality protections is like if, you know, if it was classified as an ephemeral stream and so now it's no longer a protected waters of the U.S. and there's a long distance to, uh, you know, the nearest perennial stream or lake or wetland, like maybe that could, um, could have an effect. But, um, you know, that was kind of yeah, an example I could think of. Yeah, so basically it's kind of outrageous that members of the Supreme Court were pondering all this ecological ecosystem watershed based terminology to then, you know, regulate or not. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> amazing law. Yeah, frightening. <laughs> yeah, there is often a big disconnect between uh, between the science and uh, the, <laughs> the the legal uh, uh, terms. Yeah. Good article by Jared Mott, I think, in the most recent Isaac Walton League newsletter or magazine about the Sackett case. But yeah, Dan, you've added quite a lot to that. And then, yeah. and he talks about the ephemeral streams and disconnected surface waters. But that kind of comes up in the like that Supreme Beef Nutrient Management Plan that they just had the public input meeting on. And one of the reviewers that we all know, some of us know, was. Uh, Pointing out, so one of the things they have to determine somewhere in those plans is uh, this distance from center of field to the nearest um, waterway or even ephemeral stream. And but they're using different maps, so different ephemeral streams might be on one map and might not be on another map. Yet that's probably the most one of the most important things is because when there's going to be runoff, it's going to be in, into these ephemeral streams first. So it's all it's all kind of interesting. So not related to point source, but yeah, you know, and those I I've encountered a lot of weirdness with those maps, right? Because there's some that were you know based on uh, USGS topographic maps from the 1970s, and they have errors in them, and the distinction between a, a you know a, a, an intermittent uh, um, and perennial and and uh, yeah, they're not, doesn't really seem to match up with what's on the ground. Um, yeah. But often, like, I don't think that those maps are what's used to make the determinations often, like, you know, for, uh, I know for fill permits, like it's like, you'll request a jurisdictional determination and they'll, um, you know, look at uh, aerial photos or go out and see if there's uh, enough water during certain times of year. But um, yeah. But you know, I think you bring up another important point, like with the the distance to to the stream, and um, that maybe sometimes I may be kind of getting this wrong because I'm I'm so cynical, you know, that if I've seen like oh in practice, you know, nobody ever, <laughs> uh, you, you know, all all the KFOs take advantage of some loophole or another. Um, then I tend to discount, uh, you know, the the jurisdictional changes. But you know, that does I suppose uh, foreclose some. Um, some opportunity to regulate down the line with a different uh, administration or something. So, well, thanks, Dan. It's all very good. A lot of good points. All right. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining me.